an hour and a half. All right, well, for those of you that have been with us through this sermon series that we've called the the Good News from Luke, um, you'll know that much of the Gospel of Luke takes place on the road. Jesus is traveling from place to place. He teaches his disciples as he's on this journey um, throughout Galilee and Judea, eventually making his way to Jerusalem where he lays down his life for the world. So it's very appropriate and intentional that Luke gives another story of Jesus on the road at the end of the gospel. Now, why does that matter? I I think it communicates to us that Jesus and his message are always on the move. His message is not something that sits stagnant in one place or that it only applies when you're in a certain building. It is something that impacts your whole way of life and it's a message that is for everyone, everywhere. It's a message that can't be restrained or suppressed, though many have tried and failed. So after Jesus is brutally and thoroughly and completely executed on the cross, and then his surprising resurrection takes place, we're introduced to a story of two minor disciples who are leaving Jerusalem, trying to go back to their ordinary life, baffled by all the events that have just taken place, when all of a sudden, Jesus joins them on the road. I'll invite you to open up your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 13. It says, now that same day, Two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 and those with them assembled together and saying, it's true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. If I were to sum up this story into what, it, what is it getting at, it's about the struggle to recognize Jesus, this stranger on the road. It said in verse 16 that they were 
kept from recognizing him. Notice how the verb, it's in the passive. It, it begs the question, who kept them from recognizing Jesus? Why were they kept from recognizing him? Now, sometimes this can communicate what's known as a divine passive. It's a way of saying that God did something without explicitly saying uh, that God is the subject of the verb. So possibly God has um, concealed this from them. Or it could be that there was something about the mindset or thought process of these disciples that kept them from recognizing Jesus. And as the story goes on, I I think it, it seems to me that these two disciples were blind to the identity of Jesus, at least in part because of some misconceptions that they had about Jesus. In verses 17 to 19, it says, he asked them, you know, what are you talking about? And they're like, are you the only one who doesn't know about this stuff? And I love Jesus' next question. You know, what things? What are you talking about? I think this reveals a couple of things. One, it reveals the playfulness of Jesus. Of course, Jesus knows what they're talking about, but he holds back his knowledge for now and for a good reason. He wants to draw out a response from them to allow them to reveal their thoughts about what has taken place. According to, in their own words, what do they think has just happened? And Cleopas speaks up, somewhat dumbfounded, as there's only one topic of news anyone would be discussing after a weekend like that. Now, who is this Cleopas? I think it's interesting just to consider for a moment his identity. We know that he isn't one of the 12 apostles. We haven't heard his name until now in the Gospel of Luke, so who is he? And who is this unnamed traveler with him? As Pastor Dan mentioned last week, there were more than just the 12 disciples who followed Jesus during his earthly ministry. Luke mentions at least 70 others that Jesus sent out at one time, plus a group of women, plus larger crowds of followers that had varying levels of commitment to him. Now, since this is the only time in Luke that Cleopas is mentioned by name, we're left really with just speculation and tradition. Now, tradition has it that he is the brother of Joseph, Jesus' adopted father. So this Cleopas could possibly be um, Jesus' uncle, or at least adopted uncle. And we are also told that Cleopas' wife was a woman who is named Mary, and she is one of the women who stayed by Jesus' mother's side during the crucifixion in John 19.25. So if, if that's the case, then perhaps this unnamed traveler with Cleopas is maybe his wife, who we know was in Jerusalem as well, or tradition also identifies him as Cleopas' son. And that's an interesting possibility, though it's, it's strange that Luke doesn't tell us that. Others have speculated that the unnamed traveler with Cleopas uh, could be the author of the gospel himself. Maybe it's Luke, who is inserting himself into the story and, and giving us his eyewitness account um, without giving his own name. But others have suggested that by leaving one of the travelers unnamed, we're then, as the reader, invited to imagine ourselves as the unnamed traveler who's also trying to make sense of these amazing events. In any case, I think the important thing in the narrative is what these two disciples have to say about Jesus and how they had to surrender their false expectations. In verse 19, Where, when Jesus asked what things, and they replied, about Jesus of Nazareth. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And there it is, that they had hoped that he would be the one to redeem Israel. Israel. You know, this part of the story is, I think, very relatable. How do we respond when God doesn't accomplish something the way we were expecting or hoping that he would? These disciples, they expected Jesus to redeem Israel, which in their minds probably had to do with freeing the Jewish people from Roman oppression, restoring the kingdom of Israel as an independent state, 
You know, doing something like what Moses did with the Israelites and freeing them from slavery out of Egypt. Now, Jesus certainly did come to redeem Israel, but it didn't look like a political conquest that many thought the Messiah would accomplish. You know, the book that the, the pastor's book discussion for the Renton Gospel Network uh, just finished is called Humble Confidence. The subtitle is A Model for Interfaith Apologetics. Um, and it's, it's a bit of a technical read. I don't know that I would recommend it for just anyone, but it, it's, it did have some interesting things to say about how to have good conversations with people from other religious and non-religious backgrounds. And one of the chapters focused on those who practice a form of primal religion. It's kind of a, a group of different various religious practices, um, essentially like forms of witchcraft or of kind of worshiping uh, the trees or nature or things like that, um, consulting witch doctors. And it discusses some of the, the false expectations that are common among people from this background. They noted, there's two authors, they, and they both noted how it's common for them to see religion um, as a source for power, protection, and material blessings. That's what religion's good for, is you're, you, know, you have a problem, you have a family member who's sick, or um, you have a curse on your family, you go to the witch doctors. That's, that's what religion's for, so that you can get free of, of this sickness or of this demon. And so um, when they come to Christianity, that's kind of what they're looking for. And the, uh, the authors, they, uh, I, I wanna quote briefly from what they have to say about this. It says, it may well be that Christianity's effectiveness in providing blessings has been a major factor in the attraction of Christianity. Christianity does offer a lot of blessings, a lot of healing, a lot of miracles. Yet, if one relates to the Christian faith because of its immediate effectiveness, this makes the Christian faith at the same time vulnerable. As one of Benno's students, one of the authors, once asked him, why is it that if when you are ill, you may go to a pastor and ask for prayer and not be healed, go to a hospital and still not be healed, and then you go to a traditional healer and you may be healed immediately? Now, obviously, this is not always the case. It's, you know, it, it may even sound kind of ridiculous to many in the West. Yet the fact that this could happen even once suggests to some that the traditional healer, well, that's a valid option at, at times since it could produce the desired outcome in certain circumstances. Another example they gave in the book was of an African church leader that said to the author, my brothers and friends mock me and say, what did your Christianity bring you? Two of your children died young. Can you trust this God? The author goes on to say, seeing suffering in the life of Christians was for some a reason not to embrace the Christian faith and for this church leader, a cause for severe doubt. Now this isn't an objection that only is raised by those from a primal religious background. I think it's actually a common problem that we encounter in the West as well the problem of evil. And for some, it creates a crisis of faith or an excuse not to believe. So what does the Christian faith have to say about this reality? And I think it's important that we put the problem of evil and of the demonic powers and all these things into a bigger perspective and to a larger Christian theology and worldview. And the author summarizes that worldview by this statement. The powers of sin, of death, and the spiritual and human powers that are in opposition to God, they will continue to be active in this world. God still permits them in order to give to men and women in the whole world the possibility to hear the good news of the victory of Jesus. The children of God also experience difficulties in this intermediate time. Sometimes they are hungry, they are ill, and they die. Yet, they keep courage for they know that the powers of evil are already conquered. They see the power of God manifest in their lives when the sick are healed, when evil spirits are thrown out, when oppressed people are set free, when sinners are converted, and when they experience the power of God in their weakness. In the most difficult moments, they know that their most precious treasures 
the love of God to be his children and eternal life can never be taken from them. It reminds me of of Paul's words when he says, nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. That is something that you can't be guaranteed with a primal religion trying to seek out the next greatest source of power. The author goes on to say that concerning Christ's victory over sin and death, through his cross and resurrection, we see the basis of this confidence. Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, suffered for humankind and died on the cross for them. On the cross, he took away the sin of humankind and he broke the power of sin and of the spiritual powers which oppose God and his plan. This victory becomes, became manifest after three days when he rose from the dead and conquered the power of death. Under his protection, we need no longer fear any powers because he reigns over all. It's important to realize that Jesus is truly powerful. He did fulfill the hope of redeeming Israel. Even more than these disciples on the road to Emmaus could possibly have conceived of at the time. I love how the Apostle Paul puts it in his letter to the Philippians. He says that in chapter 2, Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. That reality, it doesn't remove all suffering from the world or from the life of the believer, but it can remove all fear and insecurity because we know the one who's in control. We know who is truly powerful and we know how the story ends. You know, even after the reality of of the resurrection set in and, and the disciples came to believe and Jesus revealed himself, he stayed with them for 40 days appearing to them and they, they knew, okay, Jesus really did rise from the dead. The disciples still had a struggle to let go of their, their false expectations. We read in chapter one of the sequel to the Gospel of Luke in the Acts of the Apostles where they gathered around Jesus after he rose from the dead and they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They still were thinking about politics. You know, they still wanted to know hey, are you going to to set up the, the, the actual physical kingdom here? And he had to say, hey, don't worry about that. Look forward to the power that's going to come from the Holy Spirit so that you can tell the world about this message. That power, it's not a weapon. It's not a political influence. It's a boldness and assurance and a fortitude to face all kinds of difficulty and opposition. It will include miracles at times and healings and other signs and wonders, but it's also larger than that. It's the personal presence of God that resides in us and with us and empowers us. If only we could recalibrate our expectations and desires. It's so hard for us to adjust our mindsets and to see the value of the greater blessings that God has for us. It reminds me of a a well-known C.S. Lewis quote from his book, The Weight of Glory, where he wrote, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. So where can we go to recalibrate our expectations, to find out what is it that God is offering us? From what source can we set right expectations? And we get it right in our story in the passage today, verses 25 to 27, where Jesus said to them, how foolish you are, how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And so it's from scripture that we can set right expectations. Moses and the prophets, it's that shorthand way 
of saying the whole Old Testament, all of the Hebrew scriptures from the books of Moses, that is the Torah, the first five books, and the prophets, which is a, a summary way of saying all the rest of the books. Scripture promises a savior who will suffer for the sins of humanity, purify people for himself, for God's own possession, and receive glory and honor. It's very explicit in at least a handful of scriptures. We get that in Genesis 3.15, kind of that first gospel message in the beginning of the Bible, where we're told about an offspring, a seed of the woman, who will crush the serpent's head, and the serpent will strike the heel of the seed, a mutual death blow. Or in Psalm 22, which is a psalm that turns from this lament and this mourning about a king being put to death by his enemies. And then all of a sudden it flips and God has rescued him and he's come back from the dead and he's singing a song of praise and blessing over all of the people that are gathered around him. Or in Isaiah 53, which talks about one who is put to death on behalf of the people for their sin. It says there that he was assigned a grave with the wicked, but then just a few verses later, after he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. So we get these very explicit uh, prophecies, uh, expectations about this. But more generally, there are patterns all throughout the storyline of scripture that lead us to expect this kind of savior. From God raising up a righteous human like Noah to bring salvation to a remnant of humanity, to the calling and faith of Abraham and the offering of his son Isaac, to the story of Joseph, who is wrongly imprisoned and then exalted to the, the second place in Egypt, to the Passover lamb and the sacrificial system, to the suffering of David before he became king, and then he's exalted and made king, and so much more. I think it reveals a, a few truths about scripture that we should know. One is that it is possible to misread scripture. So we do need to be uh, cautious and humble about our approach to scripture because many in Jesus' generation and many since have misused scripture, misread it. But it also means that it can be properly understood. Just because it can be misunderstood doesn't mean it's impossible to find out what is the message of scripture. And so it's worthy of our diligence and our studious efforts. And thirdly, it reveals that scripture can make us wise about salvation. So we should look for that bigger picture. And that is exactly what the Apostle Paul says about scripture in 2 Timothy chapter 3, often quoted, but, but worth mentioning again. He, this is Paul's view of scripture writing to his protege, Timothy. He said, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it. How from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation. That is God's rescue plan through faith, through trusting in the Messiah, Christ Jesus. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so after Jesus' Bible lesson with the disciples, they arrive at their destination. And at their invitation, Jesus stays to eat with them. In verse 30, we pick up again. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And then he disappeared from their sight. So, Notice what was the key to their eyes being opened to the reality of who Jesus was. It's, it's easy to miss it. If you just are reading through uh, very quickly, if you're not looking for it, but it was the, the breaking of the bread. Now, this is a significant phrase that's been used before in the Gospel of Luke, and it might even sound familiar to you this morning since we just broke bread this morning together. It is exactly what Luke talks about when, uh, or what he wrote about in the Passover, Jesus' Last Supper, where there in Luke 22, he said, 
Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and then he gave it to his 12 disciples saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The details about breaking bread in this story after the resurrection, is, it's clearly intentional. It's, it's meant to leap off the page, immediately make you think about what happened at that Passover meal and the practice of communion that the church continued to practice from that point on, that this is Christ's body given for you. And so the best way that I can sum up what we need to allow our expectations to be adjusted by is that sacrifice that was made on the cross. And so we can set our right expectations by meditating on the cross and, of course, the resurrection with it. But notice that their eyes were opened when Jesus broke the bread. And that is profound. It's even mystical. And I use that word, uh, I don't use it lightly. The, the Bible study lesson that they underwent, it prepared them with the knowledge, the understanding, but their eyes were still blind to who Jesus was right in front of them. It wasn't until they had the experience of broken bread that their eyes were opened. It wasn't until the significance of of Christ's body broken for them was revealed in a tangible way that they saw Jesus. Likewise, I think reading our Bibles, it's a very important practice. It's nourishing, it's illuminating. It makes us wise to the plan of redemption. And hearing the facts of the gospel laid out, it's a necessary first step. But there is another step to encountering the living Christ. Will we accept the broken body on our behalf? Will we participate in the body of Christ? And as Jesus says elsewhere, eat his flesh. Which means, will we trust in his sacrifice? for us and then live lives that are sustained by his life just as we need food to be sustained in our bodily our our bodies i should say we need his life to sustain us spiritually and this is what is meant to have new life this is what it means to be born again it's not simply an intellectual assent to a list of doctrines it's not believing the right things but it is a spiritual transformation. It is Christ cutting you open and performing heart surgery, removing your heart of stone and giving you a heart of flesh. Or you know, another way of putting it is, is maybe he's doing eye surgery. He's removing those cataracts that you didn't even realize were there that may, are making you blind to the reality of what he's doing in your midst so that you can see clearly. I love, again, how the Apostle Paul puts it when in his letter to the church in Ephesus, he writes, I keep asking that the God of, all, of, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. This is something that the spirit does in us. Um, you know, in the, the sermon or the uh, Sunday school series that I'm, I'm teaching, um, I've been teaching and we're now just finished the 11th week going through church history. Um, today we covered, at least in part, the story of John Wesley. And I thought just how appropriate his testimony is um, to this, this very thing. You know, John Wesley, you may be familiar with the name at least, Uh, He was raised in a religious household. His father was a respected reverend in the Church of England, and his mother, Susanna, um, taught him scripture growing up. And at the age of 17, uh, John studied at Oxford University, and he began to take his faith more seriously. He began to read the Christian classics. And in 1728, John was ordained in the Church of England. He returned home for a time to assist his father, but then he returned back to Oxford where he met up with his brother Charles, who was also at Oxford. And Charles had formed a little group of students who were all really committed to their faith. Um, They came to be known as the Holy Club because they, they had strict spiritual disciplines of fasting weekly, of regular prayer, of um, giving to the poor, of visiting those in prison, doing all these um, great religious practices. 
And so John joined them and even uh, provided some leadership for them. But even though they, they did all these great things and they came to be known as the Methodists because of their methodical approach to the religious life, they still uh, had a lack of an inner peace concerning their salvation. He tried, John tried serving as a missionary um, and as a clergyman in the American colonies, but his min ministry there, it was actually a total failure. Um, it led him ultimately to flee back to England and he was completely discouraged and felt like, I'm a total failure. Uh, you know, I need someone to come and save me, much less me going to save others. But once he was back in England, he met a young German preacher named Peter Bowler, who told Wesley that he needed a new birth. He needed to experience God's forgiveness of his sins for himself. And he encouraged John to, to put his faith in Christ. But John, after a long struggle, you know, he, he finally did have an experience that gave him that peace. It was on May 24th, 1738, that he wrote in um, his journal afterwards. He said, in the evening, I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street, where one was reading Luther's preface to the Epistle to the Romans. About a quarter to nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt that I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. You know, this is really what it takes. This is more than just doctrine, just head knowledge, just going through the motions. But it is actually putting our faith in Christ and then allowing his spirit to do that transformative work. You know, living this kind of Christian life, it, it might look very similar to someone trying to live a moral life, but it comes from a different kind of peace because it comes from a, a different motivation. It isn't us trying to prove ourselves to God or to anyone else. It isn't us trying to earn God's favor. It comes from a place of gratitude and from the prompting of the spirit who really becomes your best friend, who becomes your guide in life. You're excited for that next discovery, that next portion of grace on that next leg of the journey. And it's a life that's dependent on that daily supply of grace. So do you need that road to Emmaus experience? You know, Jesus is alive today. Are there some false expectations that we need to give up so that we can see Jesus as he walks along the road of your life with you? I've included in your sermon guide just a few reflection questions to consider, um, to take away from this. And just first, thinking about your experience of reading scripture. Is it surprising that Jesus could go throughout the whole Old Testament and do this Bible lesson to show, hey, this is, this is speaking about the Messiah and this is what it shows all along? You know, or do you need to set a goal for yourself to deepen your understanding? And we have a couple of great opportunities coming up. I just want to quickly plug. One is Life on Life, as I mentioned. It will be starting April 22nd, where you can... Help, um, be in a community, hear other people discuss scripture with you so that you can deepen your understanding and do your own personal deeper study. But also we're going to be starting a new um, Sunday school class at once we finish the church history uh, one in the green room. At least there's, there's two adult Sunday schools I should mention, one that Dirk teaches here in, in this classroom and the other in the green room. And once um, that church history series finishes, I'm going to be going through uh, what we call class 201, the art of discipleship, which includes um, going through different spiritual practices, but it includes um, biblical uh, kind of Bible intake, I should say, and Bible study as well. But second, another question to consider is why, why was the key to recognizing Jesus the breaking of bread? I think that Luke intentionally puts this puzzle before the reader and makes you have to solve it yourself. And, and I've kind of outlined it for you in, in some of the thoughts that I've shared, but how would you put that into your own words? What is significant about the breaking of bread? And third, share with someone a moment in your life that your eyes were opened to who Jesus really was. 
it's so important that we hear each other's stories and that we share the, the stories that we have experienced so that others can be edified by them. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you for all that you've accomplished with Christ and on his death on the cross, his resurrection, Lord, that power, that conquering of the spiritual forces of darkness, the power of sin and death. Lord, we ask that you would increasingly make that a reality in our lives as we learn to walk in that power, that freedom, in the blessings that you have for us. And Lord, we, we know that it, it can at times be material blessing. It can be healings. It can be miracles. And we thank you for when that does happen. Lord, we also just seek to walk with you humbly every step of the way and trust in your grace, Lord, to get us through every difficulty, every trial, and to show us the way of escape and temptation. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to stand with me as I read the benediction from the end of 2 Corinthians. It says, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit